It's time to put your health in your own hands. Get ready to learn from today's top health and wellness innovators and thought leaders on Optimal Health Radio. Now, here's your host. Hi, everyone. This is Tammy Patzer, and I'm excited to introduce today's guest, Karen Burns Allen. Karen's passion for health has guided her work for more than 20 years as an integrative clinician, educator, author, and nationally awarded thought leader. She speaks on clinical therapeutics, research, and emerging healthcare disciplines in conferences around the globe. She has a clinical focus in the areas of endocrine issues and hormonal and sleep disturbances. Since 2013, Karen has worked with Mahendra Trivedi, originator of the remarkably potent biofield work known as the Trivedi Effect, researching its capacity to create real-world outcomes that matter. Welcome, Karen. Thank you, Tammy. It's great to be here. It's really good to have you here, too, because sleep has really been on my mind lately because we just had a time change. And I have just been really tired. The second it gets dark, my body says, hey, it's dark. I want to go to sleep. And obviously, it's only five o'clock or (laughs) so uh, that's something very interesting. But I know you work with clients who have sleep disturbances. And this is a pretty common problem because, like I just said, we're we're on the go 24-7 often because we're in this global economy, we are working with people literally around the world in different time zones. So isn't sleep disorders or disturbances, is this really a problem or is it just something that everybody has every now and then? Mm, That's a great question. And, you know, a, a perfect brief example of it is the time change. You know, this is being recorded just after the autumn time change. And uh, we've got a lot of debate in the medical community about whether we even still need to be doing daylight savings time. There was a time when it was important, you know, when we were saving energy and uh, it was actually a major factor when daylight savings time was invoked. But now, do we really need to do it? Because there's a huge medical impact. We know that people are more likely to have a heart attack in the week after the time change. And, and you know, I, I read statistics like that, and I almost laugh, like, you've got to be kidding. That cannot possibly be true. But it's really, really true. And when we have a 24-7 world, and we have people who do shift work. We have, you know, I was up this morning at 5.30 because I had a meeting at 6 with people who were international in different time zones. So a lot of us have things that nudge our sleep schedules and might create a little bit of a problem. But I have to say this is fundamentally different than people who really have trouble with insomnia or with sleep fragmentation. You know, there are people where their sleep gets inconvenienced, and that might happen occasionally, but it's not really a problem that impedes them. But then we go to another level where that little nudge, that little disturbance is becoming a long-term issue. And actually this, you know, Tammy, if you look around at, at, at an average, one out of every three people that's listening to this show is likely to have a sleep issue. 30 to 35% of the adult population. So those of you who are listening, think to yourself, okay, am I one of those three people where I really struggle with sleep? It's the third most common complaint after colds or headaches. And If we look at the statistics, about 85% of adults report that at some point in any given year, they've had some kind of insomnia problem. And most of the time, it's kind of short term. 
you know, about 15 to 20 percent of adults will say, okay, in the last one to three months, I had some problems with sleep. And sometimes this is the stress of a big work project. You know, you're working long hours and trying to get something done, or somebody's got a new baby. (laughs) That's certainly not a good time for easy sleeping. Or someone has a health problem and they're going and visiting a family member in a hospital or something like that. And those are short-term things that um, can end up with a short-term need for help. You know, people take some over-the-counter herbs or some sleep aids, or they might get a short-term prescription for a medication. And then after a month or two, they're back to their normal thing. But then we end up with people who really fall into the category of chronic insomnia. And these are people who at least three times a week for at least three months find themselves unable to sleep or unable to sleep well. And there's an estimated 10% of the adult population that falls into this category at least three times a week for a minimum of three months not sleeping well. And these people really, really suffer. So yeah, those are the clients that I'm reaching for solutions with. Wow. Luckily for me, I I, I generally am, I, I would consider myself a fairly good sleeper. Of course, I wake up to go to the bathroom, but you know, I get up and go back and go right back to sleep. Mm. And so uh, the other day I read an article um, that supposedly at some point people used to sleep in shifts and right first sleep and second sleep yeah, and I was thinking about that and I was going well that could make sense in in different times and and of course now you know like I said it's dark out where I'm at and I'm ready for bed <laughs> so, <laughs> I know that the hours, I still have a good three hours before I really should be. So there's other issues with sleep, such as um, hormones with, with the en- endocrine system. Um, that, that I understand that that can um, create some problems with sleep because, I, you know, I know for women, you know, pregnancy, hot flashes, other reproductive issues. And how, how do the hormones um, and the endocrine system, um, how do those relate to sleep disorders? Mm, that's a great question. Hormones affect sleep a lot. Um, one of the hormones that people in our listening audience may have heard of is melatonin. And melatonin is a hormone that's made by your pineal gland. It's a little tiny pea-sized gland that's just in the middle of your brain. And it's interesting if you look at the at different animals around the globe, the ones that live near the equator where day and night tend to be about the same length all year round tend to have small pineal glands. And animals that live near the poles where, you know, like northern Alaska where or or in the Nordic countries, where you've got really long days in the summertime and really long nights in the wintertime that take up most of the day. For those animals, their pineal glands are very, very large. So one of the jobs of the pineal gland is to detect when am I moving from my daytime activities to my nighttime activities. And when it sees twilight happening through the signal of your eyes, it releases melatonin. And the melatonin is a signal to all of your muscles and all of your bodily processes that say, hey, chill out. It's time to rest. Go lie down. And that's where we start to feel relaxed. We start to feel dozy and sleepy. And that's why some people take melatonin as a sleep aid to help them relax and sleep. So that's one of the hormones. There are other hormones that also affect sleep a lot. And uh, you had mentioned hot 
flashes. You know, one of the things that often happens during menopause when the hormones of estrogen and progesterone are reducing, uh, that is also a time that sleep disturbances can happen because progesterone is another sleep promoting hormone. And when the ratios of hormones are unsettled during those times of shift, like perimenopausal women, sometimes that can be another part of falling asleep. So your endocrine system is like um, the project management for your body around sleep. Oh, it's time to wake up now. Oh, it's time to go to sleep now. In the same same way that it project manages things like, oh, it's time to digest now, or it's time to rebuild all those little tiny torn muscle fibers because somebody had a really strong workout today. So the endocrine problems that we think of as reproductive issue things are quite related to sleep issues. And interestingly, most of the people, you know, we talked about these one in three people that are our listeners that are likely to be struggling with sleep problems. Most of those folks, most of those one in three are women. That, that's really interesting. I, I actually am thinking about, you know, some of, um, some of the things I've heard about, you know, the sleep, you know, related to the heartburn and weight gain and, all of the different things because obviously our sleep is so important because like you were saying, your body is repairing itself and rebuilding and it needs that time to do that. Um, is it just the sleep at night that is such a problem? You know, what about the people when they get up and they go to school or, or they have work or other tasks that does, not getting a good night's sleep or getting the, and I, I guess some people, if they're shift workers, their good night might be in the middle of the day. Um, th does the sleep problem affect them also about how they operate during waking hours? That's a really good point. And yes, absolutely. Um, this brings up the idea of sleep fragmentation. And there are, you know, we think of insomnia as somebody who can't fall asleep. They're lying in the bed and they're tossing and turning or they're getting up and pacing the floor or they're reading a book till 4 a.m. or they're watching TV or they're doing whatever it is that they're doing, but they know that they're awake. <laughs> they definitely are not sleeping. But there are also other sleep problems that show up in ways where the person is repeatedly woken to some extent at night. And it may not even be to a completely conscious level. So they may not be aware that their sleep is being disturbed. An example of this is somebody who has sleep apnea, where they're going through a process of kind of almost waking up enough to trigger breathing and then going back into sleep. Almost waking up enough to roll over because they've got chronic back pain and then going back into sleep. Almost waking up enough because they've got restless leg syndrome and their leg muscles are twitching and spasming and then going back into sleep. So for people who have something that is causing them to not stay in a normal progression of sleep pattern, they can end up with this sleep fragmentation, broken sleep. And what we know about sleep fragmentation is that the closer together these events are, the more the person the next day is going to experience excessive daytime sleepiness. And it will actually, if the, if the episodes of fragmentation are close enough together, they will have the same experience as the insomnia folks who never slept at all. I, I think I can, I can believe that because there are times for me when I'll get heartburn and I think I remedied that by getting some bigger pillows. So now I, I can prop myself so that I'm not too flat, but I was experiencing that where I would be waking up 
several times, you know, and then of course in the daytime, you know, you have a lot to do, you're working, and then all of a sudden you just go, it's almost like a crash because you're yes, tired. Yes. You didn't get enough sleep um, over that. And, and I don't take any prescriptions or over-the-counter medications, you know, for, for, for sleep because I figure, you know, it's better if I can, you know, not and try to figure out, well, what is the problem? And like I said, you know, okay, so my pillow was too small. So now I have a bigger pillow and I can prop myself at an angle. So I'm not getting that reflex, you know, Mm. you know, because I noticed my sleep was better just by simple fix like that. So for most people, when they have these sleep problems and they're looking for help, what types of help are they finding? What is out there for people with um, sleep pattern disruptions or disorders or whatever you want to call it um, with their sleep? What help is there? Well, there's a pretty wide variety of things. Uh, Usually people who are having trouble sleeping will start with an over-the-counter sleep aid. And this can look like anything from a cup of chamomile tea to valerian root supplement or herbal tinctures to things like melatonin. You know, there's a whole bunch of of, uh, actually well-documented resources for people who need short-term sleep aids. And for some people, especially those where they're, they have major hormonal disruption or they're in huge levels of personal stress. You know, you were talking about having heartburn. Um, women who are, uh, have had a spouse who recently died or have recently undergone uh, a major life change. They had to move from one place to another or their spouse died or they got divorced or their children left home or something that left them in a situation of change that they haven't yet adapted to. We know from research that those gals are much more likely to be waking up in the night with heartburn or with some kind of musculoskeletal pain. And so they're going to be looking for something to help them sleep. And they can do mechanical things like a pillow like you had. They can do over-the-counter things. But if they really have trouble and they're not able to function, they're going to end up in their doctor's office asking for a prescription medication like Ambien. Now, these things tend to work but they're not intended for long-term use. So if you have a short-term stress and then you come back to normal, that's pretty good. But if you're using this for a very long time, there are a couple of really difficult things that happen. One of them is that it alters the fundamental body chemistry around sleep into some abnormal patterns that don't tend to correct themselves when you stop the medication. And the second thing is that you end up with side effects from the medication. And Ambien's an interesting example because people start doing things in their sleep as if they are awake. There's just documented examples of people with Ambien who get up and they go into their kitchen and fix a huge meal and eat and go back to sleep and they're gaining weight and they have no idea why because they weren't aware that they got up and ate this huge meal in the night or people who are driving their car or calling up a friend and there's sort of lights on, but no one's home. So sometimes people are looking for something that can be more effective than the -the over-the-counter aids without the prescription meds. And that's when they tend to turn to some kind of a practitioner like me, an integrative practitioner or someone who's doing complementary and alternative medicine. There was a national survey of over 23,000 people who were using CAM, complementary and alternative medicine, and it showed that they were 64% more likely to report that their health had improved over the last year. And in another survey, the ones who were using some kind of integrative CAM option to improve sleep, between a third and a half of those users agreed that the CAM options that they used for their sleep helped a great deal. 
Now, along with things that come in the form of a pill or an herb, uh, there are also experiential things that we know really help sleep. Have you heard of the term Qigong, Tammy? Yes, I, I've heard that. Um, I've, I've heard of different things like that with breathing exercises, different things like that. Yes. Yeah. So a lot of times practitioners will guide their clients to start doing breathing exercises if they do wake up in the night that can help sync up the voluntary central nervous system, the part of you that says, I think I'm going to pick my arm up now and picks your arm up. And then also the involuntary part, you know, you never have to say, gosh, Tammy, do you think you need to get your heart to beat now? You know, the involuntary part is always doing its job. And breathing exercises can help bring those into sync in a way that helps relax you. Qigong is also a way, it's an ancient Chinese methodology of moving energy through gentle body movements that allow um, an opportunity for your, your voluntary and involuntary parts of your nervous system to sync up in a way that calms any kind of hormonal disruptions and lets you sleep. And another method that I use is one that's called the Trivedi Effect. And the Trivedi effect is an energy work that was established by Mahendra Trivedi. And it has to do with a transmission of energy in the same way that Qigong does that helps improve health overall. And I actually have been working with a client in the last few weeks who had relentless relentless sleep fragmentation, and huge problems with restless legs that were continually jumping and waking him up through the night. And I just spoke with him this morning after working with the Trivedi Effect energy for the last week and a half. He told me today that for the last three days, he slept through the night without any restless legs. So sometimes we think about therapeutics where we can engage with a pill or a tincture or a tea or something we can see in our hand. And one of the things that I would like to share with your listeners is to put on the table, there are incredibly potent tools that we can harness that aren't anything that you can see, but have a huge impact. You can sure see the outcomes. Well, well, I think that's really interesting because you know, as we seem to learn more and more about energy, and if you just, you know, look around, and of course, if you've ever been walked into a room where there's a lot of happiness, the energy is very light and electric. And if you walk into a room where there's a lot of anger, you can feel that too. That's the mm -hmm. closest thing that I can ever describe to people about energy. And then, of course, like you said, um, just because you can't see it doesn't mean that it's not there and that it's not working. And I like the idea of, I know that you can move energy because I felt energy move in my own body and, uh -huh. and you know, move out of it. And it's a weird sensation but if people are aware that there are alternatives other than, you know, the pills. When you were talking about the Ambien, I, all I could re think about was they used to have this weird commercial for Ambien. And it was like, I guess it was kind of like a dream sequence because it was showing this person like sitting around a table with Abraham Lincoln and the Easter Bunny. Oh, my goodness. And it was some kind of an ad, and it was for Ambien. And I was thinking to myself, what are they? They must have been showing the side effects. <laughs> <laughs> because I heard what, like what you were saying. I mean, think about it. If there are things that you can participate in, like the Trivedi effect, that you are not waking up and driving your car or, or eating and you know you're safely sleeping and if restless leg syndrome I have had that at times I think maybe I was short of uh, calcium or 
potassium or something and, and uh-huh. that feeling where, where your leg is like shaking or moving and it it's just a weird sensation and, and it wants to move and and you can't get rid of it um mm-hmm. so, you know mine was temporary but like the person you were talking about can you imagine having that every single night and you can't sleep because your body will not let go and it's just you know literally jerking you around your bed and then yeah. to be able to sleep through the night how it's cool that yeah would be. exactly That's it's a-, a brutal experience to go through that and you know i didn't have restless leg syndrome but i did have when i first had an experience with effect, I had problems with sleep because I had chronic back pain. And so for people who aren't able to sleep well because it's a fallout from chronic pain, um, you know, it's just a different flavor of stimulus that's keeping you awake. But I had a, a very profound relief of my back pain, and then I immediately began sleeping deeply. So, you know, there's, there are a lot of different reasons why people come to not good quality sleep. And, I, you know, if they're looking for a resolution, then I'd encourage them to look beyond anything in a pill and also include all these other things that can really help them on an energetic basis for their body to repair. Yeah, but I think that, I think, you know, for me, I'm somebody that, man, if I can find an alternative that mm-hmm. does not involve, you know, taking any pills or anything that, that I really don't know what it is, I would m- much rather do that. Now, as a practitioner, um, you, you work with people in, you know, different healing traditions as a practitioner, what are you looking at um, when you're looking at an, an approach to care? How do you evaluate how, how you're going to care for someone um, since you're, you are um, an alternative medicine um, clinician? What are you looking at as you're trying to determine that approach to someone's care? That's a great question. Um, what the first part of it is that, you know, very often when someone goes to see a practitioner, the practitioner says, what's the matter with you? <laughs> and there's a focus on what's wrong with you? How are you broken? And one of the first things that I talk with people about is what matters to you? What is it that you want to be able to do in your life that you're limited in now? And one of the ways that I think of this as a practitioner is the matrix of constraint. In what way is that person constrained from being the healthy, robust person that they want to be? And what is it that they want in their life that they don't have now because of the difficulties that they're experiencing? And then we build a roadmap from where they are now into that future that they want to be part of. And Tammy, it's really an important process because especially for people who have been sick for a long time or in a lot of different ways, they have forgotten what it's like to be full of energy. They've forgotten what it's like to have dreams. I I don't know if you've ever heard this. There's an an old saying that says a healthy man has many dreams and an ill man has only one. And so when people have a problem like chronic insomnia or like the client that I spoke about earlier who had the severe, severe restless legs or like the example with you where you were being woken up frequently with the heartburn, Sometimes when people have had illnesses that have been disruptive for a long time, they forget that they can be well. And mostly they're in the mode of going to a practitioner just to try to get better enough to cope. 
And the thought that they could actually be robustly well isn't even on the table. And this is one of the challenges that we have in the conventional medical system where the role very often is disease management. Let's just limit your symptoms. But in integrative care, we're actually trying to move beyond disease management into a place where we can help somebody with what is it that matters to them. And very often, that's what I'm looking for. That's what I'm trying to work out with them. There's a a thing called the therapeutic order that is important to integrative practitioners. And one of the ways that we look at how can we help somebody is to say, what is the most likely to be of benefit with the least detriment? What's the least invasive, least expensive, least amount of side effects that we can put on the table first to help somebody? You know, if for, if, for example, with sleep, you know, in severe, severe cases in the past, one of the things that used to be done in a, a less charitable medical era was that people would have electroshock therapy for folks who had horrible chronic insomnia. Now, I would say that that's pretty much the deep end of the pool, you know, and that's not where you want to start. You want to start with things that are supportive and unlikely to cause side effects, things that, you know, you don't want to jump right in and say, yes, your first option for a sore throat is that your tonsils are coming out. You know, you can start with gentle things that support the immune system before you jump into the harsh things. So when somebody comes to see me, those are the things that I'm looking at. In what way are they constrained? What matters to them? How do we build a bridge into the healthy future they want to be part of? And how can we offer them options that respect this therapeutic order where we're trying to do the most helpful, least disruptive things first? Well, I like that concept of, you know, trying to find the the best way to deal with something in the most cost effective way. And it sounds more like health care versus um, sick. Care. Disease management, right, exactly. And this is one of the things that I think people aren't used to, but they, they deep in their heart, they immediately recognize this. I'm sure that within your listeners, if they reflect for a minute on the last several interactions that they had with their doctor, it's more likely to be disease management. Yeah. And if they're working with another practitioner that is trying to build health, then they're more likely to be looking at these CAM options, the integrative things, things that deal with repairing the energetic underlay, the root causes of disease, and things that respect this therapeutic order, starting with the lowest coercion, the least toxic, the least invasive, the least risky, and attending to what matters to that person. Well, I think that makes a lot of sense because most people, they want to live a healthy life so that they can do things like live long enough to see their children graduate from college, get married, have grandchildren, um, you know, go on trips, go on vacations, be active, you know, have a life, you know, instead of worrying about being sick. and, And I can imagine, you know, just a little bit for me, when, whenever I'm off a little bit on my sleep, I know how it affects me. So can you imagine how it would affect somebody who can't sleep a, you know, for a long time? So Karen, if somebody wants to reach out to you and talk to you, how can they contact you? Uh, they can certainly reach out to me through my website, www.biofieldcatalyst.com. Uh, you can also Google my name, Karen Burns Allen. 
uh, and I can have some links for you in the show notes about the Trivedi Effect and Trivedi Effect practitioners and about some interesting reading about sleep. Okay, great. I really appreciate that. So, Karen, thanks for spending time with me today. Oh, thank you so much for having me on the show, Tammy. I'm glad to talk with you. Everyone, this is Tammy Patzer. Go make it a beautiful day. This information is not intended to provide diagnosis, treatment, or medical advice. Products, services, information, and other content provided in this broadcast, including information that may be provided in this broadcast directly or by linking to third-party websites, are provided for informational purposes only. Please consult with a physician or other healthcare professional regarding any medical or health-related diagnosis or treatment options. You've been listening to today's top health and wellness innovators and thought leaders on Optimal Health Radio. To get more solid health and wellness information, visit OptimalHealthRadio.com. 